So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Demi Ben-Ari. I'm currently the CTO and the co-founder of a startup company called Panarays. Uh, we're in the field of uh, big data and cybersecurity. And actually, I'm not talk going to talk about the startup at all. And uh, I will talk about uh, work that I've done uh, using Apache Spark and the uh, Scala-like distributed collections at a company called Windward. Uh, a bit about myself. Um, as I said, uh, I'm currently the CEO of uh, Panorays, and uh, I'm the co-founder of a big data community called Big Things as well. Uh, we mainly focus in big data technologies, data science, and DevOps. And uh, you're more than welcome to join and contrib contribute as well. In the past, I was a senior data engineer at Windward and uh, a team leader in a, and a Java software engineer in a missile defense system for around uh, eight years. And I'm a geek, a techie. I'm interested in every technology probably that you, you will throw at me. Uh, today about the agenda of the talk. Uh, it will be Scala oriented. It will talk about Scala and the analogies of Scala and Apache Spark, but mostly it will be a data uh, talk, okay? How we transformed our data and moved it across some uh, persistency layers. So we'll start talking about the analogies of uh, Scala and Spark, uh, the data flow and the environment, and uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, infrastructure and an introduction, introduction to Spark. I, I want to ask a question. How many of you have actually used Apache Spark, even in development or production? Oh, more than a half. It's uh, great. So it will make my life easier uh, while doing the introduction. And uh, we'll talk a bit about what's our time series data like. Uh, what is the frequency and the vo volume of the data as well. And we'll talk about where we started from, when, where we got to, and what were the problems and the decisions that we've made during the, the whole process of going into production with Apache Spark. And eventually conclusions. So. At first, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Martin Odersky for uh, letting me quote him on some of the slides. And uh, we'll talk about the Scala and Spark analogies. What are the, the two frameworks or two, two worlds? How do they combine with each other? So at first, I have to say a disclaimer. Uh, most of you probably are more experienced in Scala than me. Okay, but by using Spark, I've used most of the, the abilities, the functional abilities of the language of Scala and all of the libraries are implemented in Scala as well. Uh, I think 80% of the code that I wrote uh, in Apache Spark was in Java, uh, but it's still great if you use it correctly. And uh, the other is uh, combined Scala and Python. So what Scala is? Scala is a functional language. It's also an object-oriented language. It's statically typed, and it, it operates uh, well with Java and JavaScript, and basically it's JVM-based. So you can run code from any other uh, JVM-based language as well on the uh, Scala runtime. And we'll talk about some of the DSLs we have over uh, Scala. So the one actually that we're going to talk about is Spark, but we have lots of other DSLs that we use uh, to I don't know, exploit the, the good things about Scala. Uh, we've talked about Spray, SBT, and other kind of like Akka, and other kind of DSLs that uh, lie on top of Sp uh, on, uh, Scala. And uh, we actually use them heavily with a functional uh, way of working. Let's talk a bit about the architecture of Spark and a distributed system. At first, we have to have the underlying layer of uh, the persistency, the storage layer. So we have the file system uh, area uh, of might be HDFS that is a fully distributed uh, file system, might be Cassandra that is actually a database that we need uh, by indexing and uh, giving abilities to the front end uh, servers as well. And we have S3 that is kind of a cheaper storage layer uh, of Amazon. Uh, again, how many of you are using cloud-based systems? Again, more than a half, then it's good. Uh, it saves a lot of money, and it came into consideration during our development process uh, a lot of times. So, over the storage layer, we have the actual Spark runtime. that uh, It gives us the fully distributed API over something that is called RDDs, Resilient Distributed Datasets. 
And the Spark runtime, of course, relies on the Scala runtime that relies on the JVM. And eventually, we have lots of JVMs running in our dis distributed system that are communicating with each other over ACA. Over the Spark runtime, we have the Spark REPL. It's just like the, I'm sorry, we have the Scala REPL that is uh, actually forked from uh, the Scala REPL, we have the Spark REPL, that we can uh, use it for interactive mode and uh, online querying and running Spark code even without writing a full-fledged application. The Spark REPL uses the Scala compiler, of course, to you know, get the types and uh, run our code. And eventually, the Spark runtime uses something that is called a cluster manager. Uh, when we are talking in a distributed manner, we have always the, the thought of resource management. We need to ask the cluster for resources to give our uh, computation power and to give play, place for our uh, collections, distributed collections and data. So the cluster manager comes a part of the whole architecture. So we have kind of a flow diagram that starts from the storage system, goes to the runtime that actually um, invokes all of the actions and transformations that we need to do over the data, and we ask for uh, resources from the cluster manager. Okay, so what kind of DSL is Spark? It's actually centered around collections. So if I simplify it really from a high level, it's distributed collections over a cluster of computers. They're all immutable data sets. And can somebody spot what's the, the, the function calls here? What are those? It's, it really resembles the, the Scala Collections API, because it actually is. It is the same thing to use the Scala API, almost the same thing to use the Scala API and the Spark API. So if you're, if you're talking functional, you're talking the same language of Spark. And uh, these are actually Scala Collection APIs, the API calls that uh, are the same in uh, Spark. So are Spark Collections the same as, uh, let, let's call them RDDs, are Spark RDDs the same as the Scala Collections? Not exactly. Uh, there are two main differences. One difference is that uh, Spark Collections are lazy evaluated. So if you're familiar with uh, Scala, then you know that everything is strict. Once you perform some kind of transformation over a data set, then you actually perform the action. On Spark, nothing is performed until you do some kind of action, some kind of uh, uh, invoking action, like count, like collect, like maybe saving it to a file. Everything is calculated once you do the, this action. And what is calculated is actually a DAG, a directed acyclic graph that is calculated to do all of the transformations that we want to do over the collection and over the data. Another thing is that Sparks give, gives us the uh, work over something that is called pair RDDs. Everything is, let's say if we do the analogy, the regular collections are like lists and the pair RDDs are more like maps, okay, or associative maps. And they give us lots of power uh, over NoSQL distributed world, because something that we lack in the NoSQL no world is joins, unions, maybe things like operations that do aggregations and uh, work over the data, and pair RDDs gives us the full functionality of all of those things. Okay, so the collection uh, design choices. Most of us, I think, at first came from the Java world and know all of the imperative things that we do, the, the for loops and running over uh, regular collections uh, via the util library, and versus the functional way, where of course in Scala we work with the functional way, with the uh, Scala collections immutable. We can divide it into two different groups. The strict one that Scala uses and another language that, that is called OCaml, versus the lazy evaluation that is uh, that we're able to use uh, using Spark, C Sharp, Scala streams, and Scala views that will be added in the future versions of Scala. So, what is uh, Spark, um, let's say, from the API point of view? So, it's implemented in Scala, but we have full APIs for Java, Python, and right now for R, was added in the later versions of uh, Apache Spark. So, why actually use Scala instead of Python? Because Python uh, is not natural for the Scala runtime, and sometimes we need something native that we actually can debug. Because if you want to take a Python application and start debugging it in a single IDE, it will be pretty problematic. 
So using Java and Scala for it would be more uh, natural. And we, we can actually step into functions and do different kind of uh, transformations. And of course, as you know, types are a good thing. And when we use types, we're much safer during, the, during our work. Okay, so bottom line, what is Spark? Uh, we talked about distributed collections and everything. So it's actually a unified platform. In a single framework, we can make all of these operations possible. At first, batch mode, we can uh, do batch analytics, uh, you know, read lots of data, uh, go up, do some calculations, do some transformations, and eventually write some kind of aggregation into some kind of persistency layer. And we can do it interactively as well. We don't need to write a full application and do many things. Like for data scientists, this is like heaven. This is working in a dynamic uh, environment, which I don't need actually to compile any code. And we can uh, use actual streaming banner as well. It's sort of streaming uh, because it's micro batch processing, but it's the same model that we would use in uh, every kind of way that we write code in Spark. So eventually we write the same code and we just execute it in a different manner. So it's really substantial when you're using this kind of framework in a single tool, okay? What was before uh, was actually the Hadoop ecosystem, which was the same, it was functional, it was uh, based on the MapReduce paradigm, but still eventually we needed to use some auxiliary tools when we wanted to use streaming, let's say Storm or something like it. And Sparks gives, Spark gives us the same thing in a different uh, manner when we have only a single framework working with the same model of coding. So what we have on top of Spark, what is like the, the main components that we're using? Uh, basically, we have the Spark core. This is the RDD API, the lowest level API that we're using for the collections. When we said like lists and maps, these are the things. And over the Spark Core API, we have the scheduler, uh, how we perform our tasks, and all of the basic things of Spark. Over Spark, we have many more DSLs, or some kind of higher level frameworks that we're using. One of them is Spark SQL. We said one of the problems that we were facing in the NoSQL world and in the distributor world is uh, no joints, no unions, no kind of uh, advanced operations. So Spark SQL gives us the extra benefit of using those things and uh, a known SQL language. Uh, over that, of course, uh, are any of you data scientists knowing R, scikit-learn? Okay. <laughs> so eventually, the data frames concept came from R and uh, Python. We give structure to our unstructured data. So eventually, we are using the auxiliary of data frames with Spark SQL to do many optimizations. So you take all of the data that is unstructured, and you apply schema on it. Once you apply schema, you know the data, and you can apply many optimizations over the code. Again, we have many more higher level APIs, let's say graphics for graph computation, MLlib for machine learning, Spark streaming, we've talked about the micro batching thing, and again, Spark R, and more and more things are being added to the Spark framework because it's a really active community. Okay, I think it duplicates itself every year. Uh, from 2013 and on, when the framework was uh, um, released uh, for open source. So, we've talked about the architecture. These are the actual servers. What we're seeing when we're running a Spark cluster. We have an instance of a JVM running called the master. It has the master process, the history server. It might run a web server as well to show us the Spark UI. And we have the resources, the resources of the slave servers which are running JVMs as well, and everything is running on, the, on top of the JVM framework. And we have, for the resources, two kinds of resources. One are cores, which are actual CPUs, and the other are worker memories, which are the in-memory RAM memory that we're using to do all of our transformations. So, to sum things up, it's a big cluster, or a small cluster, it depends on the amount of resources you throw uh, on the cluster that you want to be using. And you control everything via the resources, and not via the computation, and not via each server and its strength. So let's talk about the data flow and the environment that we had at Windward. Um, our use case, actually. So I'll say a really couple of words about Windward. It's a maritime analytics company. So basically, we're doing ships. 
Okay, uh, movement of ships over the world, and uh, it's in the scope of all of the world, and not in a single uh, location. So the data are geolocations, like geolocations with a lot of metadata, but eventually it's a place and location at a time, at a certain time, so it's over time and time series data. And different types of messages are being reported by the satellites. You have a, a protocol, eventually it's like HTTP, but for ships. It's encoded. So you are getting encoded data and sometimes it's compressed and might arrive later than actually transmitted because some things might happen in the way. Maybe the uh, data provider had a latency problem or your service fall, fell. Let's talk about a visual data flow of the diagram. So you have satellites reporting data and some kind of external data sources that we're combining the data with. And everything is being parsed, and the raw data is being served uh, on S3. Why S3? Because it's much, much cheaper, and I will show you in, in future slides what were the considerations of actually going to S3 instead of like something like HDFS. Then we have our Spark uh, analytics layers, the entity resolution process, uh, going over all of the data. And you can see it's kind of a funnel. Okay, and why is it a funnel? Because when I read the raw data, I filter a lot. Okay, I uh, transform and move the data and add more logical layers than the raw data. So each layer that I go forward with, I actually downscale the data because of that, it's a funnel. We started saving it in multiple persistency layers. Uh, the data output layers that you can see here are Cassandra, MongoDB, S3. Some was as well in uh, MySQL, but it was a really small portion of the data. And we formed, I know it looks like maps, but it's not really maps, it's layers. And we formed uh, many analytic layers, that logical ones, that actually form ships over the raw data, over the raw data points that we've uh, read in the raw data. And it separates it into two, I think, wide spectrums of the big data world. We have the anomaly detection one, when w what's interesting is the small percentage of data and uh, problematic ships that are doing something wrong. Uh, this is more interesting for the intelligence world. And we have the market trends, when a, where a single data point doesn't really matter because we have lots of them and we want to aggregate the data and give market trends. Let's say where all the oil in the world resides. I think it's an interesting thing for economics. So for the engineers, this is like the, the higher level scheme of uh, what our environment looked, looked like. It was one cluster, single cluster of all of the resources, all of the environments running on a single cluster. We, have, uh, we had our considerations cost-wise about it. And we have many services uh, working on all of the environments, saving into different persistency layers on the right. So you have uh, the front end servers and the web services that are uh, in Node and uh, a framework uh, that was written in, uh, at Outbrain uh, that is called Obic. Why? Because we had people from Outbrain. And uh, we have a gray log uh, for log monitoring and Grafana for metric monitoring as well. And of course, Jenkins for orchestration and continuous deployment uh, framework that we've used. So the basic terms, we'll talk about like some things that will make uh, communication much easier and uh, for me to explain what I'm talking about a bit easier. Item potence. Basically, it's the same input, a, a function that gives us the same input will give us the same output. Okay? And once we want to apply this kind of thinking of our data, we're not keeping any state, which I think all of you know that state is hard. Okay, managing state and uh, trying to replay, as we said in the last talk, is really, really hard. So once you're keeping your environment item potent, then you can write and, uh, let's say, read, write, and do many transformations over the data uh, really easily over and over again and not uh, being afraid of screwing the data up. Okay, missing parts in time series data, as we said. Data from our satellites can, uh, satellites or data providers, it, it really depends on the type of data provider, can be missing, can come with a delay, and it's mostly, it can be because of the delayed transmissions by the, the service provider. Uh, the data vendors can delay the stream because they want to, because their service is down or something like it. And when we're calculating all of the data layers that I've talked about before, something can go wrong even in our code. I know, I know it's shocking, uh, but it can happen, and we write code with bugs. So something can happen, and a hole in the data 
can emerge. And what happens then? If we're keeping everything idempotent, then we can rerun the process on this specific time window that failed, and uh, the data will be completed uh, with a stateless manner. And uh, again, we're, as I said before, we're calculating all of the data, data layers uh, with time slices. So, another good term that we need to start talking with are partitions, okay? This is the, the analogy for the parallelism level that we're using in our computation. How many of you have written code with threads? Almost everybody, that's good, okay? When we're talking in the Spark world, Forget about threads, okay? Stop working with threads because your parallelism should be controlled by the amount of resources that you're giving for, it, uh, for your application and the amount of resources that the cluster is giving you as a developer. And again, we talked about the abstraction, which is actually resilient distributed data sets, RDDs, which are <coughs> collections, okay? Uh, all of the collections that you know and love from Java and Scala. All of them are full torrent, full torrent and uh, we can use them to know that if something fails, everything will be recalculated when we perform the action and the scheduler, the Spark scheduler, will redo the computation that actually failed and only that, not everything from the beginning. And uh, it's actually applying immutable uh, transformations over our RDDs. So the Spark collections are analogous to the Scala collections which are immutable. So, what's the problem? We have a great framework. Everything works, right? Not exactly. Uh, the problem, uh, the time series problem that we've uh, described before uh, can be shown in the next scheme. We have t equals zero, which is the beginning state, nothing came, no, we have no data. And then on t equals 10, we have data coming, but with a hole here. You can see it here. And uh, everything is, of course, only the raw data in the first uh, layer, the entity. Then we calculate the next entities, uh, logically, and we go forward with the window. So you have the window computation size that you probably fixed, or it depends on you. And what happens when late data arrives? Okay, we don't look back on the data, and we will probably miss everything for the calculations for the future, but it's relevant data, right? So this is the, the problem of, of uh, handling late coming data. So how do we solve it? We create dependent microservices that microservices are actually Spark applications in our manner, and the services should be dependent only on the data. So if I have the data looking back, then I rerun the process and do something. If I don't have the data, I need to invoke all of my dependencies and go forward with the calculation. It's, it's a bit different than scheduling uh, regularly because something when you schedule it regularly happens every specific time and nothing looks back and recalculates unless you do something active to do so. So we form a kind of backsliding window. Because we said it's a funnel and we downscale the data each uh, process that we do, then we can read actually more data over the same resources. Let's say we have 100 gigabytes of RAM that we read raw data to, then we go forward, the data becomes, I don't know, maybe 10, maybe less. And then we can read more data from the past and take in consideration more data that was probably missing beforehand. But it really depends on what you need because uh, data over a ship, uh, I think a month uh, beforehand, isn't really relevant, okay? It was there, something happened. I really don't care about the ongoing system. And uh, forming all of these things might cause some biasing in our data as well because uh, when we have data, we're greedy, and we're, when we're greedy, we read more data, okay? So let's say I want to replay everything, and I will want to start from the beginning of history when I have data and rerun the process. What happens? And what, what actually happens that I can read data from the future and not run in a, a certain state of a backsliding window and re write, uh, write and read uh, data from the future? It's bad, okay? So, because your streaming and ongoing process is different from your bootstrapping process, and then you have many weird kind of bugs that you haven't foreseen because you, w you didn't take in consideration when writing the code. Okay, so what was the starting point? And this is like the more data-oriented thing uh, that we uh, we're going to talk at the talk. We started off with a standalone deployment. Uh, there are multiple ways to deploy Spark. One of them, the basic, the most basic one that given by uh, the Spark developers, 
is the Spark standalone. We had around five nodes. Uh, if anybody knows Amazon, it's uh, more memory-centric uh, instances, R3 extra large. And uh, we didn't want to keep any persistent HDFS. Uh, how many of you are running HDFS in production? Okay, you know it's pretty costly if you're not running on your uh, dedicated data center. Because if you're running on cloud, you need to put persistent uh, servers that are really expensive. And eventually, when we ha only have 100 gigabytes per day, that's a, uh, about the amount that we've had, over the span of four years, you will have 150 terabytes of data. Okay, it is really costly. Per year, you will probably pay uh, per server around, I won't say 2,900, because you can uh, buy some uh, upfront uh, contracts, but you will pay a lot of money if you want a really large cluster. So basically, we chose a different kind of uh, persistence layer that is less reliable. Okay, you have a higher latency, substantially, but still, uh, when I want to add more computation, I just add more computation nodes, and I have the same power that I had with a good persistence layer, but it, I think less than 50% of the cost. And uh, any of you ops guys, this is like uh, hell, heaven, I'm sorry. It's a simplification of the Amazon calculator when you can actually calculate the instances and how much will you pay over a, every instance, which is uh, very, very, very vague when you're using the Amazon calculator. Okay, so we started working with F3. Uh, which is the simple storage layer of Amazon, uh, you pay by actually putting and getting things. Okay, So you don't pay about the amount of data that you're putting, uh, with the actions I mean. You only pay for the amount of transactions you do, and you pay for the storage. But you can see that it's substantially lower. You can see that for 150 terabytes, you will pay $210 for all of the four years of the data that we need. It's amazing. Okay, it's mostly talking about the raw data, but still. And we use the same format as HDFS. We have, uh, on S3, you don't have the concept of files. You have the concept of keys. You have a certain bucket, which is a logical storing unit. And on, on a bucket, you simulate the, the existence of uh, folders. So you can see you have entity one, certain date. Uh, the granularity depends on what you need. You can, this is like, represented in minutes, you can use it for seconds, you can use it for only days, and you have the partition files uh, as in HDFS. So, we solved the problem of uh, storing our data, and cheap, that's good. But what about serving? Because you can't rely on front-end servers to take data from S3, you will, it will take forever. Even if it's not indexed, it will be worse. So, for serving, uh, the most evident one and the easy one was, okay, let's use MongoDB. We have only five servers. Let's write things. It's JSON, so uh, it's really easy. I can put unstructured data and I can transform everything if I need. Okay? Yeah, it's good. Sounds good. But what happens when you have many workers, which are the parallelism level that we're using, and everything writes to the master? Okay, because if you're uh, deploying Mongo on, in production, you have uh, the master replication, and uh, you write to the master, it replicates to the replicas, and everything is clogged until you do so. Even if you do it unacknowledged, still, you have an unpersistent uh, manner. So it's problematic when you upscale and you want to use more servers. Uh, the uh, servers that we're using, as I said before, are R3 uh, extra large for CPUs, uh, 30.5 gigabytes. I really don't know why the 0.5. Okay, ask Amazon. The storage layer was ephemeral, and we had around 10 plus servers. It depended on the amount of throughput that we needed to get from the infrastructure. And we were using older version of Mongo because it was without the new storage layer, so this was like a year and a half ago. And we're using a 2.6 with four CPUs, 15 gigabytes of RAM, EBA storage, and we had around uh, the DB size was the relevant collection that I'm talking about. It got to, in the beginning of the development, to 500 gigabytes. It had um, five indexes, and it was four of them were compound. Okay, what was the problem? The problem was that every bad job should run in five to 10 minutes. This was, this was the scope. But actually, it ran for 40 minutes. So why? Okay, 40 minutes is a lot. 20 minutes was to write all of the, uh, uh, to, to write all of the data uh, asynchronously unacknowledged, which is the, un the most unsafe way to write in Mongo, and 20 more minutes to sync the journal, 
which is crazy. Uh, it's unacceptable. Okay, for 40 minutes to, to run a 10 minute uh, process. So nothing responded. The UI didn't respond, of course, because the database is unavailable. We need to do something. So we had some alternative solutions. One of them was Sharded Mongo. Has anybody ran Sharded Mongo in production? Is it fun? No. Very. Very. Okay, cynically talking. <laughs> Uh, okay, the pros, uh, uh, you can increase the throughput by actually adding more shards. It's good. Increasing availability of the database as well, because you have more points to, to access to get the data. But the very hard part of it is DevOps-wise, managing it is hell. Okay, try upscaling and resharding your cluster. It's really unfun. And you had, when you have a small team, it can be a problem, it can be a bottleneck, and probably it will stop your development and the high cost of servers, because everything needs to be replicated three times and by the amount of shards. So the replication is uh, like really confined to the amount of servers that you need. It's pretty bad. How would it look like? It will look like this. You have a master on every shard part of the Mongo, and then you need to write everything still to the master and replicate everything for being available, blah, blah, blah. But you continue with upscaling by adding more, uh, like, three tuples of uh, servers. It can pre pretty, I don't know, like, harden your work ethics because every time you need to upscale your data, it's a mess. So this is probably how our dev DevOps guy would look after this kind of transition, and we had no DevOps guy, so guess what? We look like this. Another alternative so solution was Cassandra. Okay, uh, how many of you have heard about Cassandra, using Cassandra? Oh, a lot, that's great. It's a great database, but the pros, the, like the good things, a uh, very large developer community because it's an open source, open source tool and we have a, co a company backing it called Datastax and you have some services that you can use. Linearly scalable, and when I say linearly, it, it is linearly because you need to add more things w once you add a, a great capacity to your cluster. You have no single master architecture. There is no single point of failure. You have multiple coordinators that you access and get the data and perform all the actions. And it's battle tested, it's proven, okay, to work with distributed systems like Apache Spark. The cons, we had no experience at all, okay, with Cassandra. And there is no geospatial index because we said all of our data points are geospatial and you need this kind of indexing. So we actually had to implement something uh, of our own to downscale the data that we're uh, getting and then filter it in memory with real geospatial uh, spe uh, queries. So the solution was to migrate the, the, big uh, the big bulk of data from Mongo, the 500 gigabytes and more, and to move everything to Cassandra. So we started using the DataStacks community AMI. AMI is it's like an image of Amazon, whoever doesn't know Amazon. And uh, we deployed it, and it was great. We started using uh, the Spark Cassandra connector, and it was really great as well, because when you had a uh, small scale of data, it's okay. It was really easy to bootstrap, uh, bootstrap the process, the development process with the DSX connector. And we created monitoring dashboards uh, using uh, Grafana and uh, using the Op Center, which is the default solution uh, from DataStax about uh, Apache Cassandra. So how does it look after Cassandra? We have many workers uh, accessing individually different coordinators which hold the data, and I don't have to wait for locks and everything about the data. It's good. And I'm getting responses and everything back from uh, the servers as well. So I can write, read to different servers and scale linearly. So eventually after the, the boost, we had a, a great improvement. We went down to three minutes of writing all of this data uh, from 40, which is great. And what it took, we, we did it before some kind of a conference that we had, the big maritime conference. And from zero to hero, in two weeks, we had something running in production and giving us great results latency-wise. It's really good. So again, what's the problem? Everything is good. We have serving, we have our uh, backend process working well. Another problem was that our heaviest process was trying to read and write 30 gigabytes per iteration every 10 minutes. Uh, when we upscaled the data and worked on all of the data, of course, and doing replication factor three on Cassandra, which is probably the default that you should be using, 
would be writing in a batch process, in a bulk, 90 gigabytes of data, which is pretty much a lot. Okay? At first, it took us 18 minutes, again, unacceptable in a 10-minute process. This was how the op center looked right before everything started crashing and nodes started dying. It's a bad, bad, bad picture. And uh, it was a problem. And again, we started uh, in an improvement process over our Cassandra cluster. We ditched the AMI, which was the recommendation of data stacks, actually, because it's not production ready and you should tune things yourself. We chose the I2 extra large, which are uh, both I.O. and memory intensive instances are expensive, but still. Optimization to the cluster, to the structure of it, and the amount, of course. Changing the JDK did an uh, amazing thing. Uh, I started it us with using uh, the CMS over Java 7 and uh, with 30 gigabytes of data, uh, of RAM, I'm sorry. And I upgraded to Java, Java 8, Oracle Java 8, and changed the GC algorithm to G1. And once I changed it and downscaled it to 8 gigabytes, the performance was amazing. Okay, you didn't have any stop the worlds. You have timed uh, around 200 millisecond uh, stop the world actions and it improved the throughput of Cassandra drastically. Tuning operations to the operation system as well, because it's not only data, it's not only the JVM, you have the U-limits of the Linux system. You have removing the swap, and I know it's dangerous, but still, I don't think that ever a Cassandra node crashed before uh, because of the, the swap that they uh, finished. And the, the write time went down to five minutes for 30 gigabytes with the replication factor three from 18, Sounds great, right? Sounds good? I don't think so. Again, because if uh, you have a bit of a hiccup and you uh, get more data, uh, like for a small chunk of time, then it can overlap and uh, you can start uh, accumulating a leg. So it's not that good. Actually, the data stacks guys that I've consulted with told me that this is probably the best that you can get from uh, the, the relevant uh, architecture of Cassandra that we've used, cost-wise, of course. And this was uh, the CloudWatch uh, on Amazon. Again, the monitoring system. We had 100 CPU utilization, 100%. We had the disk operation rights for 10,000. And this is probably the best that you can get from these kind of instances. And you can see hiccups. I don't know why it's more than 10,000, but it should be 10,000. It was the best you can get out of the architecture of Cassandra that we were using. So the solution was to take everything from Cassandra and to move it to S3 with the same indexing. And then you have a fully distributed system, which runs really great, okay? You pay much less, and we got an improvement from five minutes to one and a half minutes, and that's more like it. That's more the, the process that we wanted, because if something happens in the computation and it lags, then the writing of the data and the reading of the data won't do something wrong, okay? So uh, everything was really great, and we had to run a, a different process because uh, with lower latency, let's say, that we needed to serve the data for the clients as well, but we ran it every 15 minutes. We, can, we could run it uh, every half an hour as well because um, we did a downscale of the data again. When you have a straight line of dots, you need only the beginning and the end. And it might save even like 80% of a story tale of a ship, and you don't need all of the points in the way. So we could downscale everything because we didn't do the real computation every time, and we had a different process that did that offline. It's ships, they don't move that fast. So you can, you can accumulate a leg of a half an hour and nothing happened to the ship. It didn't move even on the map for the user. Okay, so how it looks after all. We had parsed raw data coming to Spark, writing some static data to Mongo, because we didn't ditch Mongo, it's a great database, I don't wanna diss it, and we would write our heavy process to S3 and then have an offload process to downscale the data and uh, get it for the serving, for uh, the data and for the static data as well. Okay, so conclusions. Always give an estimate to your data. Always give an estimate to your data because you need to know what's the frequency and the volume that you're uh, accepting to your system. Because if you don't know how to answer these questions, you will be in a big problem when you will tackle the problems uh, performance-wise. And always arrange the previous phase the way that the next phase should accept it the, the best way. 
because organizing the data is one of the key concepts of working with lots of data and big data. And again, remember my words, there is no best persistence layer. Okay, there is the most suitable one for the problem, and try not to overload your system as well, because we are programmers, we're lazy, okay, at least I am lazy, and we tend to overload our solutions to say, okay, it will handle it, it will handle it, it will be okay, because it's a computer, it does things fast. Okay, try not to overload the things, and try to separate your applications to do different kind of things for different kind of outcomes. And again, Something that is very important about Spark, it's a great framework, but it's it, not a silver bullet. You need to know how you handle your data. And this was the main focus of the, the talk. When you have a single server, you can run everything in Scala, it will be amazing, okay? When you want to upscale and you want to use a distributed system, Spark is great, but again, you need to know your data. You need to how to transform the data and store it in different storage layers. And with great power comes lots of partitioning. So know your partitioning, this is your parallelism level, okay? And this is how you control your distributed system and distributed computations as well. Okay, probably you look like this, okay? I've talked really fast and a lot. So are there any questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's one interesting thing I think you could perhaps do, maybe it depends on your use case, mm -hmm. uh, that I've found useful for, um, especially when working with um, streams of data and uh, Cassandra especially, um, is use streaming rather than batching. Now I'm curious to know whether it suits your use case, if so, why did you choose batching, if not, why okay. does it not suit, suit your use yeah, case? Yeah, great question. Uh, we started thinking about using streaming at first, okay, but still uh, our, um, the structure of our data was that we needed to handle uh, late coming data a lot, and it was most of the data, most of the times. You could have a lag of around eight hours sometimes, and in this way, the, the streaming manner would accept the data, but accepting the data wasn't our problem. Uh, like, it was taking a real big bulk of data, reading it, and then doing the computation. It wasn't aggregations. It's not like we have a certain ID and then we aggregate the, the outcome to, I don't know, a specific database, a state, or something. We need to take all of the data all the time, and if a, a single data point came in the middle, then it changes the, the overview of the ship. Uh, I think it can change it in a 100% like, uh, degree. And uh, it's a bit problematic to using it streaming. For streaming, I can use it for storing the data. You're 100% you're right. If you have the throughput problem. But we didn't have that problem. Uh, regular HTTP clients uh, accepted things and just stored it in S3, and it was pretty OK. So if I understand correctly, you need to uh, sort your data because you need it to come. It doesn't come in order, but you need it in order? Yeah. I needed, I needed it to be in order to take the computation because I, each time we read a specific time window, okay? And uh, most of the th streaming frameworks, both Spark Streaming and Storm, they handle or single events or bulks of data that needs to be stored. So for the storing thing, it would be a good, great solution, really. But we didn't have a problem there. The biggest problem was like uh, digesting a real uh, large amount of data, and this was the biggest problem there. Because of that, we used like batch windowing instead of uh, streaming. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, it, it's, it's for that. Yeah. Partitioning in Spark <laughs> yeah. is a very popular solution. But it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, okay, you have some problems with partitioning. Partitioning is how many partitions should I use? Yes. This is the, one of the problems that emerge. And it really depends on the data. It really depends on the amount of resources that you give uh, for your application, for your job. So if I give it like 10 servers and I give it 10,000 partitions, it might be better, but I'd rather not to give it less uh, partitions than the resources because I have uh, slow comers maybe, right? And uh, this is mainly chosen by configuration that you give your job. So if I know that I'm going to read around 100 gigabytes of data, I know that it should be partitioned across, I don't know, 100 servers, then I 
repartition it accordingly. You can do it by calculating the partitions, doing running your job. You can't like query how many data, uh, how much data I have, and then repartition. But when you form an RDD, you can um, perform. You can give it another parameter, giving it the amount of partitions. So, so that's it. Trial and error, basically. Yeah, at first uh, on development, because you know again, it, it goes back to the point knowing your data. Once you know your data, there are some like uh, formulas. Uh, this amount of data uh, partitioned and the replication, blah blah blah, and you get a number. Okay, but mostly we would use probably time slots. If I'm reading 12 hours, probably my best partitioning will be 12 hours across I don't know less nodes. Okay, if I need uh, if I need more uh, parallelism level, I add more, and you can repartition your RDDs across your computation, so you can take a transformation. Add more partitioning, like spread the data, but uh, it does come with a cost. It might come with a cost of shuffling, and it might degrade your performance as well. And because of that, you need to know the API, and you need to know how to transform your data. Okay, so basically, this is how you control it. More questions? Thank you very much. Have a great day.